for listening to Balance Black Girl. My name is Les. I'm your host, and I am so excited to have you joining me today. So this show is all about conversations that involve everything that helps us feel healthy, happy, thriving, all of the different things that we are balancing in our day-to-day lives. Now, back in January, we had an episode talking about getting your money together, and we talked about a lot of foundational concepts of setting up bank accounts and budgeting and talking to your partner about finances and maybe asking for a raise at work. But what I've learned in my financial journey is you can only manage and cut back and budget and save so much that when you have big goals, when you have big things that you want to achieve, it ultimately comes down with being comfortable asking and sometimes striving for more. So I'm really excited to be joined by today's guest, Rachel Rogers, who is the founder of Hello7, which is a multi-million dollar company that helps entrepreneurs of color build thriving businesses. She's a self-made millionaire. She's an attorney. She is a mom of four and someone who I've really had the pleasure of learning from from afar. And so I'm really excited to welcome her on the show today. So Rachel, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. Let's, yeah, let's talk about making some more money. (laughs) Yes, please. So Rachel, I have to tell you that I read your book, We Should All Be Millionaires, I think right after it came out, back in like the summer of 2021, like right after it was released. And that time in my life was very, very pivotal because I had been kind of a personal finance girly for a while. And I had learned a lot about budgeting and starting to invest. And I had started making my first decent salary and I wanted to understand what to do to manage my money. And when I read that book, it was the first time that it occurred to me that I could I could be okay asking for more, that it's okay to want and ask for more and not just kind of accept what is given to me. And that time period, kind of 2021 to 2022, after I read that book and after I really implemented the concepts and opened my mind to receiving more, I started reaching a lot of big goals, business, financial, professional, that I, even the year before, didn't think was possible. So I just really have to thank you for that work because it's been so impactful for me. Um, And I know I've talked about the book a lot also on social media. We're going to link it in the show notes so that if people have not read it yet, they can read it. Can you share with us more about what your financial journey has looked like and how your relationship with money has changed to get to where you are now? Yes. Oh my God. It's changed massively. When I was a kid, I mean, I was always focused on my money. So let's be clear about that. I definitely, that hasn't changed even as a kid, because, um, you know, I came from a low income family. My family struggled financially all the time. We had our lights being turned out. We had, you know, the landlord coming to the door, you know, banging on the door, asking for the rent that was late. So my parents were often stressed about money. And this was something I saw. I didn't understand why, but I just knew they didn't make enough or whatever it was, but they could just never seem to make ends meet. And so I was very interested in like, how do people make money, even as a kid? Um, And so I was very interested. I was drawn to professions where I thought money would be made because that's what people say. Uh, And so that's what led me to becoming a lawyer is just watching courtroom dramas with my mother as a kid and seeing like the lawyer, first of all, being well-dressed, being well-respected, being well-paid, but also advocating for the little guy. Right. And so I was like, Hmm, that seems interesting to me. And so even from like eight years old, I was like, I'm going to be a lawyer. Um, and I, you know, as a young adult was always overdrafting my account. I was always calling the bank and like negotiating with them. I had a lot of negotiation skills. (laughs) So I'd like negotiate with them to like take away the overdraft fees. Like that was my story. I was constantly like from one overdraft to the next paycheck to paycheck um, and was always stressed about money. I'd go out to lunch with my friends and then like look under the table on my phone to be like, you know, let me just check my balance and, you know, please don't decline in front of my friends, you know, and like don't order a drink, order this inexpensive meal. Like that's kind of how I always thought I was always like counting every penny because I had to, I really didn't have a choice. Um, And so I went from that to, you know, being in a, having a more abundant mindset because what I've learned over time is that scarcity does not create abundance, right? So when you have this, I have to hold on to every penny. I'm never going to have another dollar, right? Like save, 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 right? Cut, cut, cut. 
that doesn't actually lead to wealth. What actually leads to wealth and, and hard work doesn't even necessarily lead to wealth. It can, but sometimes it doesn't. There's a lot of hard people, hardworking people in the world and they don't have a lot of money, right? They're not wealthy. So it's not about hard work. It's about risk. It's about taking risk. And so it's like, are you willing to bet on yourself? Are you willing to invest in yourself? Are you willing to um, take a risk, right? And usually that's what it is. It's buying assets, which is often a risky thing. There's no guarantee, but that's where the upside is. And so I understand that now after many years of having very little and then getting a little bit more and then starting to notice as I built my business and started to make more and more money, oh, it's these things that actually, it's not my labor, right? It's not my hard work and sweat and tears and 16 hour days that is actually leading to more capital. It's when, it's when I was strategic enough to say, okay, what are people asking me for all the time? How could I turn that into a package that makes me money when I'm not there? So I created a package of contract templates and a guide to like how to do all of the legal stuff called Small Business Bodyguard back in 2013. And that thing made me millions of dollars, you know, and I didn't have to work for it because I was an attorney where you, you know, you like, you put in an hour, you get an hour's pay, right? And so that was revolutionary, like divesting time from money. The first time I ever did that was mind blowing. And then I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> this whole money game is not what I thought it was. Um, so yes, it, it's definitely shifted over time. And I still uncover limiting beliefs that I have that I have to like conquer. I think we're all making as much money as we believe we are worthy to make and that we believe we can make, right? So we're all creating our own ceiling, truly. Because if we believe that we can have more and we want more, we will find a way to make that happen. And we're just, and, and making money is really not that hard, right? You put money in an investment account, you sit and wait, suddenly there's more money in there, right? That's just one example, but there's so many examples of money not being difficult to make. It's just, we choose to believe that it is an, and society definitely wants us to believe, right? That it's very difficult to make money. That is very challenging that, you know, be happy with your salary because you'll never get more, right? Like it's, it's designed that way, but we have to recognize that that's not true. And we have to follow the clues of people who are wealthy. What, what pathway did they take? What kind of decisions were they making that led to that wealth? Absolutely. I would love to touch on something that you've said about learning to be comfortable with risk. I also come from a low income background. And I think that when you grow up in that kind of environment, you become very afraid of risk because risk is scary. When you already don't have a lot, the idea of losing what little you have is absolutely terrifying. And I think it's why a lot of us end up either in these careers or in these jobs or like you pursuing the law where it is this false sense of safety. Were there any things that you did or experiences that you had that helped you become more comfortable with risk that ultimately led to bringing in more money? Yeah. You know, what's interesting is um, I have a sister and that's, that's exactly how my sister is. So, you know, she wanted to quit her job that she'd been at for a decade. And she's like, when I have a year's worth of salary in the bank, then I'll quit. She had that money in the bank for like three years, still didn't quit. <laughs> right. So like, she's much more conservative than I am. And that was her response to our childhood. Right. My response was like, I'm already broke. So what, what, like, I can always find a job I hate. I can always scrounge together a couple pennies, right? Like, so like, that's not hard to do. I know how to be broke. I'm very good at it. I know how to rob Peter to pay Paul, right? Like I know how to navigate those waters and like make a, just enough come in or how to feed myself on the cheap, right? I know how to do all of that. So I was kind of like, if I'm already broke, what does it take? Like, you know, what is it really costing me, right? To take another risk. And that's what I did when I started my law practice. That was my first business. I had job opportunities. I didn't like any of them. And I was like, I've been a broke student for seven years, right? Between college and law school. And then I was broke before that. So I've just been broke my whole life, right? If I'm, if I'm going to continue to be broke, okay, fine, right? Like if I wind up broke from this law practice, that's nothing new for me. That would just be more of the same. However, if it does wind up working, that will be life changing, you know? And so I just said, I'm going to do it because what I didn't want to do was wait till I was working at a law firm making, you know, really good money. Like, let's say I was making $150,000 a year 
And I'd be afraid to give up that salary to go start a practice. But when you have zero, right, it's not hard because there's really no other alternatives that are really that great, you know, or maybe they're worse. So, um, so yeah, for me, I, I, th I think I'm a less risk averse person just in general, but it's also like weighing the pros and cons and taking calculated risk, being strategic with risk, right? I do a lot of research as well. So like I'm always, I want evidence, right? That this pathway actually works for some people. And then once I have that, that's enough for me to say, like, I want to move towards abundance. I want to move towards what I feel like I'm being called to do. Like, I think this is my assignment on earth and I need to move towards that because I think sometimes we have ideas or there's something, some passion inside of us and we are squashing it because we want to be practical or logical and it will just nag you and be in your ear, right? And just make you miserable. So just go ahead and do it, right? So that it'll stop, you know, nagging you. <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I loved what you said about finding evidence of what's possible, because I think oftentimes when we do our research and we look for context clues, we look for all the clues of what could go wrong. And those things are possible, but what could go right is also possible. And so seeking out examples of that is so important. It's so true. And like looking for role models that are a few steps ahead of you, right? Like you know, I, I was talking to someone earlier today and they were like, you know, we think our examples are JLo and Cardi B, right? But we're like, who who are the regular women who maybe don't have huge careers in entertainment, but are making good money? And that's what, I, you know, look for people within your profession or just mentors that you find online or people who write books or people who have podcasts, right? That you can look to to say, okay, what can I learn from this person? How did they make this happen? Um, and so that's what I did. When I started my law practice, there was a mentor his name was Jay Foonberg. He wrote a book about how to start a law practice. He talked about what it looked like to start right out of law school. I followed every speaking gig he did that was in like the tri-state area near New York. I was there. I was like traveling to Atlantic City, wherever I could go, right, to hear him speak. And I learned from him and just hearing him say it over and over again and hearing the stories of all the people he had helped start a practice, I was like, okay, this is actually possible. It's not as pine as in the sky as, as some people say or think. And I just want to try it. I'm just going to give myself the opportunity to just take a risk and, and do it. And of course, in the meantime, I'm also like, okay, how am I going to pay my bills? Right? Well, how much money do I need to make? Like, you got to be strategic and smart about it. But take the risk if that's what's calling you. Because yes, there's huge potential upside. Absolutely. And this is like lessons that I'm learning in real time. So I also am taking this in like she's talking to me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm also talking to myself. I'm reminding myself, right? Like of my own ceiling that I've created for myself, right? Like even at this level, my company makes egg figures, but our goal is to get to nine. What's stopping us, right? A lot of it, this is why like therapy is my most important appointment every week, not just for my own personal well-being, but also because I know that there's still limiting beliefs in my head that I have to still continue to work through to break through that next level, right? So like we're always working. There's always more to learn. There's always more growth if we want it, right? It's available to us. Yeah, definitely. What are, I know you just mentioned therapy. What are some additional practices that you recommend for people who are looking to raise their ceiling so that they can start believing that they can have and earn more? Yes. So <clears throat> two things. One is um, really rewrite your story, right? Like what is the story that you're telling yourself all of the time? So if you're saying like, I can't afford it, if that's like your mantra, please get a new phrase, <laughs> right? So like, instead of saying, I can't afford it, maybe there's another word that's like, I cannot, I'm choosing not to buy that today. And, you know, I will be able to buy that in the future, right? Or I'm choosing not to buy that today and I'm saving up for an experience like that or whatever it is, but just like reframe it. Because I think when we say I can't afford it or use language like that, it just limits us. It's like, oh, this is not available to me, right? It's, it takes our power away. I want us to use language that puts us in the driver's seat. Because the bottom line is, could you go buy some, you know, expensive Gucci shoes today? You could. Would your rent be paid? Maybe not, but you absolutely could make that choice to buy those shoes, right? I know people who do um, instead of paying their rent, <laughs> right? Right. Everybody's had that moment, right? Um, yes, but it's just like, honestly, we do have choice, right? But we're just choosing to be responsible or we're choosing to invest in our well-being. Could we go you know, live in our parents' basement and keep all of our money and spend it all on vacations. We could, that is a choice. And it's not necessarily a bad one. It's like, what, what matters to you, right? What's important to you? So I think it's like, take, take the, 
it's not, there's no they out there stopping you, right? Like there are, is absolutely systemic systems, right? It, it is all designed, right? These systemic institutions are designed to keep us from having money as people of color, as women. Um, it literally is designed that way. And despite that, we still have agency. We still get to decide what am I going to wake up today and decide I'm going to do? What goal am I going to set? What am I going to work towards? Right? We still have agency and control. So let's use language that reminds us that we are in the control seat, right? We get to say what happens next and how we do it. And there's nothing that we, that we might want that is not available to us. If you want to build a billion dollar company, you could go do that, right? That's what I'm trying to do, right? If you want to have some, you know, mansion in Malibu, you can make that happen, right? Like literally, no matter what it is, you can actually find a way to make it happen. So just decide that everything is available to you and reframe some of those negative beliefs or limiting beliefs that you might have around money and just replace them with things that make you feel more abundant. That's really what it is. It's like, it makes me feel like I have options. It makes me feel like things are available to me because that's true, right? You do have options, right? Even when I was broke, I had options, you know? Um, so that's one of the things that I would recommend people do is just reframe those, those limiting beliefs. And sometimes it's literally like, okay, so I, if you, you might have a thought that's like, I'll never make more than $50,000. Maybe that's what's playing in your head. Okay, cool. Write that down. I'll never make more than $50,000. Is that true? That's the question to ask yourself. Is that true? And you might say, yes, I think it's true. Okay, well, I want you to write down all of the evidence that you have that it's not true right? So look in your life for the evidence that it's not true. Okay. I have a friend who has a similar degree and experience and she's making a hundred thousand dollars a year, right? Okay. So that's evidence number one. Um, you know, I've seen other people who have similar experience to me who got hired in tech and they're making more money. Okay, great. What else? I have another friend who started her own business and she's making more money than me. Great. What else? Right. And you just keep coming up with like, oh, I have this like, um, skill set that people always ask me for. I bet you if I charge for it, I can make more money. Uh, write it down, right? So it's like, then we start to create like 25. I want you to write 25 reasons. And if you can't think of it in one sitting, keep coming back until you have 25 pieces of evidence that that is a lie. Because what you're actually doing is changing the neural pathway in your brain, right? Because we have these neural pathways. When we say the same thing over and over again, it becomes like a tape. It's like a record playing in our heads. We have to change the tape. And in order to change the tape, we have to create evidence that that's not true. And that allows us to create a new pathway, right? Going into a positive place instead of a negative place. So that is part of the practice of like changing your thinking. And I also have another exercise as well. <laughs> so that's first, you know, reframing your thoughts. And then the next thing that I recommend people do, this is in chapter six of my book, is um, this exercise I call million dollar vision. So it's like, what do you want? right? Let's be fueled by what we desire. I think we need to get more in touch with, with what we desire. There's this great book called um, Women Who, I think it's Women Who Run With Wolves is the name of it. It's amazing. I just uh, listened to it on audiobook recently. And one of the questions she asks is, what are you hungry for? And I love that. I think that should be a practice. Ask yourself every day, what am I hungry for, right? What do I desire every day, right? Because I think we squish down what we want. Let's get re, like reconnected to our desires. And when you ask yourself that, it's like, okay, what are those things? And it's okay if they're practical material things. So like, maybe you want a nicer house. Maybe you want to send your kids to extracurricular activities, right? Maybe you want to hire a personal trainer. Maybe you want to go on vacation with your girlfriends without like having to count your pennies, right? <laughs> Whatever it is, it's like, okay, these are the list of things that I want, right, in my life. I also want to like, let's say you want to put, you know, $2,000 a month in an investment account. Maybe you want to help like retire your mom, whatever that combination of things that you want is. Okay, great. Now we've got your list. Now let's do some math on it. How much does it cost per month to live that lifestyle, right? How much more do you need to make? So if you figure like, okay, I pay, you know, $2,000 a month for rent, but to have a nicer place, I'd need to pay $4,000 a month. Okay. So we need $2,000 a month for that. Personal trainer is another thousand dollars a month. Okay. Add another thousand, right? My vacations will cost me across the year, $2,000 a month to save up for all the vacations I want. Great. Let's add it. Right. So just add it all up and figure out what is that number? This is literally the exercise that I did to be like, how am I going to make more money? Because I need this. I need to make more money for all of these reasons. And so I list out everything that I want and I do the monthly, what is the monthly additional income that I need 
to make that happen. So let's say it's $10,000 a month that I need. Great. So we know $10,000 a month is a target. We know why we're working towards it. Now let's brainstorm. How could we make another $10,000 a month, right? So let's do it less. Like if you wanted to make another $10,000 a month, well, what's one thing that you could do to make $10,000 a month? One thing I could do, oh my gosh, what I need to do and is on my list this year is to create either a course or resource for aspiring podcasters because I actually get asked how to start a podcast or advice for aspiring podcasters every single day of my life. <laughs> I love it. Yes. So let's say your course was $1,000 for the course, right? And you sold 10 of them a month. Boom, $10,000 a month, right? So, and you might even say like, okay, for people who want the more, more advanced experience, I'll do a VIP day with you, plot out your whole podcast and like map everything out and I'll charge you $10,000 for the day, right? For speed, right? So you're, and you're in more uh, individualized attention. Now you just do one of those a month, boom, $10,000, right? So it's like, and I'm sure if we sat here and thought about it, there are 25 other ways, right? That you could make $10,000 a month if you actually brainstorm. So I really want us to train our brains to look for the money-making activity, right? The money-making opportunity that is available to all of us, right? All of us have natural talent and skills. We have experience that we can use to generate more capital. So that's what we do. We brainstorm. And then once you've brainstormed, you choose one or two of the things off the list and just try it, right? Go do it and see what happens. And what's going to happen is you're going to make more money and they're going to be like, oh, that was easy. <laughs> you know, you know, like, because even if you create a course, it might be work the first time, but then after that, it's just going to keep selling and you don't have to really do anything right for it to be delivered. So that's easy, right? Um, it's maybe hard the first time. And I have this saying, work hard once, right? So you do the work hard, the, the hard work one time, and then it continues to make you money. So that's the, uh, that's the pathway that I tell people to go to. It's like the gateway to training your brain to see the opportunities uh, to generate additional income. And then also being connected to why am I doing this, right? Because when you're in the middle of creating the course and you might be like, ugh, this is so much work, right? Then you look at your list and you're like, oh, but all this is on the other side, girl, keep going, you know? <laughs> well, and what I really love about that exercise that you just laid out for us is, and the question, what are you hungry for? And I definitely want to read that book. I've heard of it, but I haven't read it yet. Is it, encourages us that it's okay to want things and it's okay to yeah. want more. And I think what a lot of us struggle with is like settling for less and settling for crumbs and feeling guilty, wanting and aspiring for more. And I don't think that's something that we should feel guilty about. No. And, and let me tell you what, this whole society is designed, especially as black women, as women of color, as people of color, the world is designed for us to feel guilty for wanting anything, especially women. Right. And so fight that. Right. Like if you want to fight the patriarchy or fight white supremacy, the way that you do it is say yes to your desires, say yes to your creative ideas. Right. Believe in them and bet on them. That's how we change it. Right. Because there are there's so much research that shows that when women make more money, we invest in our communities. We take care of our families. Right. Like literally whole communities and neighborhoods are improved if the women start making more money. That's how we invest in, in ourselves and our community. Men do not invest in the same way, right? Of course, some men do. A lot of men don't. <laughs> so literally, you know, when they said the future is female, it's true, right? If more women have more money, we are going to see the world improve in a variety of ways, including giving us more political power, right? So that we can have more balance, so that our needs can be represented, right? So every identity can be represented in you know our governments this is and political power comes from economic power that's just the practical realities of it you might hate capitalism but it is the truth it's not going away probably in our lifetime right so how can we work within this system and use it for our benefit and the benefit of the people right that we love and care about and want to serve and so that's how we do it it starts with our desires like we actually are given desires so that we're forced to say yes to these creative ideas and say yes to doing good work in the world like they're connected right if i never wanted to like have a better life and be able to take my kids to you know extracurricular activities this business wouldn't exist that is serving thousands of people and has helped thousands of people of color become millionaires and make lots more money, right? Like none of that would have happened if I didn't just have a selfish desire to have a nicer house. 
And the, and now because so many people, you've helped other people build businesses and become millionaires, the ripple effect that that then has on their communities and their ecosystems, it's like a rising tide lifts all boats. It's true. And some of the women in our community are even running for office. One of them has held public office. Like we're starting to see that connection with politics as well. And I'll tell you a story recently at ROI, we shared this, but last, the first um, ROI, which is my annual conference that I do. We did the first one in January, 2022, um, or is it 23? Actually, sorry, January, 2023. And we wanted to partner, it's in Puerto Rico. And so we wanted to partner with a nonprofit there. And so we found a nonprofit that was focused on maternal health and helping women have babies and have midwives, right, in a healthy environment because Puerto Rico has this horrific stat that like over 50% of the women um, wind up having C-sections because it's the convenience of the doctor, right? And then once you have one intervention, like there's, it opens the door for so many things to go wrong. And that's why the infant mortality rate, like the, the maternal mortality rate is high, right? Labor is a dangerous moment for women in certain environments. And so we partnered with this nonprofit and we decided we were going to, we did some, some work with them, some volunteer work. And then we also decided we were going to write them a check, right? We we're going to write them a check for $25,000. And then at the last minute, I was like, you know what? double it. <laughs> and so we made it $50,000, which I was, compl- I didn't have to check with a board. I get to just decide that. Right. So we give them $50,000. And then I didn't think anything of it. I was like, just happy that they were out in the world doing good work. Fast forward nine months later, they reach out and they're like, Hey, we want to show you what we did with the money that you gave us. And I was like, Oh, cool. Like, I'd love to hear all about it. I'm thinking we're going to have a call and they're just going to tell me about it. They're like, no, 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 no. Come to our new facility. And I was like, new facility. So anyway, I go and visit. They built the first birthing center in on the island of Puerto Rico with that $50,000. So it didn't exist before. You could have a home birth or you can have a birth in a hospital, which has the stats I just shared, but that's it. But if you wanted an assisted birth with a midwife in a birthing facility that is not a hospital, that did not exist in Puerto Rico until we wrote that check and they did that work. And now it exists. And it's amazing. Like I'm, my mind is blown. Like I have been preaching this and teaching this and researching this. And still the fact that I got to be a part of it, like all I had to do is write a check and literally like have changed lives. Right. And they're also training midwives there. All of these midwives of color are being trained. Right. So there are more midwives available. There's doulas that they're training, like what they're providing in the prenatal care is incredible. People from the U S leave here and go there to give birth now. So I'm just like, oh my, what else could we do? (laughs) You know, like now, now I'm hype, right? Like, I'm like, okay, we did that. Let's go do something else. So that's one of the things that is possible. Like you could write checks that change the world if you you say yes to making more money. So I want people to understand that and like, don't put a ceiling on yourself. I think we are meant to do so many things, right? And not everybody has to do something huge, but like, what in what ways could saying yes to yourself actually serve other people too? I think it's both and. It's not either or. So buy your Chanel bag if you want a Chanel bag. Take yourself on a nice vacation. Buy the house that you want. And then also, you know, continue to earn more money so that there's surplus so that you can invest in your community as well. For sure. I mean, that's such a beautiful story. Thank you so much for sharing. And it's an example of like generational impact. Now, yes. people in that community their families will continue and are safe and are healthy. Like that will continue on and on, which is just absolutely incredible and really speaks to the power of getting more money in the hands of good people so that people can do good with it. Exactly. Exactly. And it was like, I mean, I just, I can't believe it that that like sort of me just following my instinct in the moment and was like, you know what? I think we should give them more. And the result of that is amazing. So there's so many activists and people out here doing really important work and they need funding, right? They don't just need us to march in the streets with them. They also need us to write checks. And if we're in a position to do that, right, people who share their values, like it makes it so much more easy to like actually accomplish our goals. So I think it's important and it's the entire argument for why we should all be millionaires, why we should all be focused on our money because it has this full circle effect. Now you are enough, right? So you less are enough and worthy enough to make more money. So if you want to be a millionaire for the sole purpose of enjoying your life, that is a worthy enough cause, right? You matter, right? And so you are enough that you should have more money if you want it. 
And I also just know from research of how we get down as women, what's going to happen is there's going to be a, a ripple effect, even if it's your neighbor, right? Like the little girl that lives next door knows that like, Less ha owns her place and has her own business and does all of these things, right? Then she's going to look at you and be like, oh, I could do that one day, right? Imagine my, how my life might have been different if I had a wealthy, dope woman living next door, running her own life, right? Running her business and having assets. I'd be like, okay, girl, I'm on that pathway too, you know? <laughs> so, and so much sooner. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly right. <laughs> So something that we talk about a lot on this show are habits. The Balanced Black Girls yeah. love habits. And something that I loved in your book that was such a big takeaway for me was understanding the difference between a broke ass habit and a million dollar habit. Can you explain for the girlies what that means, what the difference between those two things are? Yes, because what you want to do is move towards abundance, right? So if you want to become a millionaire, you have to lay the pathway with habits and decisions that allow you to become a millionaire, right? You you becoming a millionaire is not going to be one decision you made at some point in your life. Like, yes, you could make one pivotal decision, but it's not just that. It's what are you consistently doing? What kinds of decisions are you consistently making? What kind of habits do you consistently have that are leading to your million dollar life, right? So we have to think about how we're showing up every day not just the one time like, oh, I quit my job. Great. What happens next? Right? <laughs> like you left. Now what? You know, what, what, what is your, yeah, what does your to-do list look like? Right? When you get to your desk on Monday, what action steps are you taking? What moves are you making? Right? And so that's what it's about. And we need to make moves that move us towards abundance, right? That allow us to uh, move towards our creativity, take advantage of our ideas that make us feel more abundant. When you feel abundant, you are going to make really good decisions. And from that place, you are going to, you also are going to take risks that you need to take, smart, calculated risks that move you in the direction towards wealth, right? If everything is miserly and like pulling in and just getting smaller, right? Like, oh, I have to save every penny. Um, it's all about like contraction, right? And so it's like cutting off your ideas. It's cutting off opportunity. It is not making you feel good, right? And from that place, you're going to make decisions that keep you small, right? And keep you in that space of like, this is my last dollar, so I better save it. My husband used to always say like, stop treating every dollar like it's your last, you know? Because he even, even he grew up poor as well and still has, an, he always had an abundant mindset. Like there's more where that came from. And I'm like, how are you like this? Where did you get this from? <laughs> Why do you believe this? Because I believe the opposite. <laughs> but truly, like when we do that, if you think about it, right? Like, for example, you this pathway that you could create to create a podcast course, right? And help people start their own podcasts. You know, maybe you'll like, uh, you want to take a course on how to create a course, right? Very meta. But like, maybe you want to hire your own mentor to like help you do it and help you do it faster. Let's say that that was like a $5,000 investment. And you're like, oh. I can't spend $5,000. That's bananas. I can't do it. Like that's too scary. And so you do it your instead by yourself. Maybe it takes you a while and there's pieces that you can't figure out. There's technology issues that you haven't sorted out yet. And so it just takes you a year, right? That's a year worth of selling that course that didn't happen because you wanted to save the $5,000. Or you could spend the $5,000 and in 60 days you have like all the answers, right? You have a support um, community like cheering you on, right. And holding you accountable, you launch your course and boom, that's a year's worth of income or 10 months worth of income you wouldn't had because you spent the 5,000. So it's just learning that like, we always think about, Oh, this money I'm going to lose, but think about the money that is out there, the opportunity cost, right. As well. Like, what does it cost me to miss out on this opportunity? Because that has a dollar amount attached to it too. For sure. I think one of the biggest mindsets for me that has been really helpful in learning how to think this way is beginning to see money as a tool. And like for the example that you just gave, that $5,000, yes, that's spending, say, $5,000, but how much time am I able to get back from that? How, if I spend the $5,000 to create the course and then I make $100,000 in six months, that's a pretty good investment, right? To invest, you know. I like that. I like those odds. I would take that all day. Very ambitious math, but. <laughs> but I think it's also very doable, right? I have an audio book um, on Audible that just came out and it's called Six Figure Side Hustle, where I'm literally 
in 10 steps, I'm showing people how to create a six figure, so at least $100,000 side hustle within 90 days. That is totally doable. I think when we say like in five years or in two years or in 10 years, it's our, it's just fear, right? It's like, we're like pushing it into the future because we don't want to take action today. That's why the habits are so important. It's like, what am I doing today to move me towards the direction of, you know, being wealthy. So like one of the habits is um, doing a money generating activity every day, right? So like, what's one thing I can do today to move me towards that? So it could be like, okay, I'm going to, you know, um, email a mentor and say, hey, I want to create a course. I know you've done it. Will you tell me about what your experience was like? And I have some questions, right? So like that could be one money generating activity, or it could be like, I, you know, five people have previously asked you about creating the course. So you email those five people and say, Hey, I have a course in mind. Would you like to take it? It starts on this day. I'm going to teach it live. You're going to be my only group that ever experiences it live. After that, it's going to be recorded. It's, you know, X amount of dollars. Are you interested? Right. And maybe two of them say, yes, great. Now you just got money in the door. So, you know, just continuing. You could also be just pitching yourself every day to different, different opportunities. Um, there's all kinds of ways that you can take money generating activities. Like what's an activity you can do today that will generate some money. It doesn't even have to take all day. And usually it's the, it's so funny because we just like procrastinate, you know, like we'll spend all day like, I've got to work on this landing page and make it perfect. Or like, I got to create this perfect reel for social media. Or we could just send the email to the one person that wants to hire us and just say, hey, let's do it. Here's how much it costs. And like that one email would would make you money even if you took everything else off your to-do list, right? <laughs> like, so it's like, let's focus on the most important thing. Usually we're avoiding that because it's scary. It's scary to ask for money, right? It's scary to pitch yourself and to ask for the sale. That's where the money is at. Notice what they all, all those activities have in common, risk, right? You're risking your ego. You're risking someone rejecting you. That's part of it. That's part of the journey of building wealth. Oh, I just love how it's all connected to everything we've been talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so good. So I love that you mentioned your um, Audible original about six figure side hustles. You also have another great Audible original called How to Plan Your Year Like a Millionaire, which is fantastic. Yes. And one thing that I loved that you shared in that was you started off with an example uh, from Serena Williams earlier in her career about learning how to set bigger goals. Can we kind of talk through that story for a second and why it's important to like think bigger when we're setting goals? Yes. So Serena, I can't remember the exact numbers, but she, you know, she had a certain number of grand slams and like successful titles, you know, that she had earned, you know, as a tennis player. And I think she was getting bored and complacent and she also was getting stuck, right? So she kept losing. She had a losing streak for a little while and everyone's scared because we're like, this is the goat. What's happening, right? Something's gone wrong. But I think she just was no longer motivated, right? She set this goal that was like, she was trying to get, I think to like her ninth title or something like that. And it was just like, she couldn't get there, right? She was at eight and she just had to have one more and it just wasn't doing it. Then she set a different goal. And I think it was her trainer who encouraged her to do so. And she set a goal of having 19, right? Like, why are we going for nine? Well, we could go for 19, right? Like, let's do something that's unheard of. Let's do something that no one's ever done. That's more. So then she was motivated and excited again, right? I think it's easy for us to lose our motivation because we set goals that are like obvious, like we could trip over it, right? It's so easy. <clears throat> and then we're just like, I'm bored and we plateau and get stuck, right? Which is kind of what happened to Serena. Well, when we set big goals, that are like blow your mind goals. It's like, oh my God, what if that were to like really happen? Wouldn't that be crazy? You know? And when we feel that way, we're like, fuck it, let's do it. Right? <laughs> like, let's, let's just try it and see what happens. And so then we're just motivated all of a sudden. It just brings in a flood of fresh energy and excitement and high energy. And then we just push towards it and go. And even if you fall short of the goal, it so exceeds the like regular goal that you were thinking about setting, 
that you still, your mind is blown. So there is research around this. And I talk about it in my book about why it's so important to set bigger goals, right? And so setting a goal of becoming a millionaire, that's not out of reach. And anyone tells you it is, stop talking to them, okay? You come hang out with me in my community. <laughs> you have a whole bunch of people who are like, me too, girl, we on the same pathway. Here's the things I did, what you about to do, right? Like, and sharing information and helping each other. Talk to those folks. There's always gonna be someone who's gonna tell you it's not possible because they're too scared to even try, right? So it's not possible for them because they've decided it's not possible, right? Uh, but you need to get those people right out of your ear and be moving in the other direction. So setting really big goals is is key to, you know, it's a risk. It feels risky even to tell someone, I want to accomplish this big goal. Like that feels scary, right? And whenever you're scared sighted is what I call it, where you're scaring yourself a little bit, but you're also hype, that's how you know you're on the right pathway, right? When you're bored with your goals, they're not going to happen because you just, they're not the kind of thing that will get you jumping out of bed in the morning, you know? Right. It's, it's almost like you don't really care. There's no room to grow into them when it's a little yes. too low or when it's a little bit too easy. And I think that's what a lot of us bump up against. Yes. And we think like, oh, let me set a practical goal. And I'm like, practical is my least favorite word. <laughs> There's absolutely nothing practical about my life. There's nothing practical about where I started and where I am today. And so when I look back over the last, you know, 15 years of my career, I was not practical and that's what got me here. So if I want to get to the next big place, I have to not be practical, right? Like use, you know, the take the learnings from this level and apply it to the next level as well. You know, the whole being practical is a way to keep us safe because we're afraid of failure and we're afraid of someone rejecting us or we're afraid of failing publicly. Listen, if I fail publicly, like, listen, I I'll be like, hey, I failed y'all, <laughs> you know, and just own it and then say, here's what I'm going to do next. I think when you are honest and vulnerable in community a lot, there are going to be some trolls who say terrible things, block them. And then there's going to be people who rally around you and say, like, how can I help you reach that big, exciting goal? Right. Like, that's what happens. Or how can I help you o overcome this or recover? Or I failed, too. Right. Thank you for saying it out loud, because now I feel seen. Right. So I think when we're vulnerable, it brings us together. But we got to be willing to risk our ego. We got to be willing to risk some of our time. We got to be willing to risk our efforts. We got to be willing to risk some of our money. That's that's the pathway. It's so true. It's so true. And to the kind of limiting beliefs point, something that I've been reminding myself a lot is that nobody who is doing better than me or who is at a point that I want to reach would like judge or look down on me for not hitting a goal or for stumbling a little bit. Or even if I'm cringe and I put out something and I try, <laughs> people who are where you want to be will never judge that because they know what that's like. They know what that's like to be there. It's the people who are too scared to try, who are going to give you a hard time about it. And who cares what they think? Because they're not... They're, they're not doing what you want to do anyway. So, you know, why are we letting the opinions of people who aren't where we want to be and who don't know what we're doing uh, kind of limit us and, and keep us small? Why are we letting other people's limiting beliefs form our beliefs? Exactly right. Exactly right. Do you think I don't have a thousand cringe moments behind me? <laughs> so many things that I like even find on my hard drive or like old websites that I'm like, oh, what is that? <laughs> Take that off the internet immediately. In fact, I have my old YouTube videos and I invite people to look at them, okay? Um, our YouTube channel is youtube.com slash hello7. And if you go there and you scroll down, you're gonna see these old videos from when I was promoting like my law practice. I mean, this is like 13 years ago, right? Um, and so I was doing these videos and I was literally like, psh, 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 like whispering. You know what I mean? And like, I had long hair and it's like my hair was like covering up my face. Like I'm like, I, I'm on video, but I didn't want anyone to hear me. I didn't want anyone to see me, right? Like I was so, you know, scared and fearful, but I was forcing myself to do it anyway. And I leave those videos up because I'm like, I want you to remember, I was not always this confident and this loud and this, you know, boisterous. There was a time where I was very fearful, but I, even though I was scared, 
did it anyway, you know? And those videos, when I tell you, they brought me so many law practice clients. Like I made so much money and I think I did like 15 of them. Like I didn't even do a ton of them. I did a certain amount and then I was, got busy running my law practice and they brought in so many clients. So we all have to start somewhere, right? Don't, don't compare your beginning to somebody else's like 10 years in, you know? Um, and just allow yourself to get out there and don't worry. We're all cringe sometimes. It's all good. Don't worry. <laughs> There's like that expression where it's like, if you're not cringing at your initial, whatever it is you did, like you're starting too late or you're waiting yeah. too long. And it's so <laughs> true. It's so true. Like people say, oh, I went back to episode one. I'm like, Ooh, at your own risk. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you want to do. <laughs> That's the thing is. It's funny because when I listen to those videos, like I'm, I'm cringing at all the whole like vibe of it. Right. But when I actually listened to what I was saying, I was like, that girl's smart. She knows what she's talking about. You know what I mean? So, so even though some things about it are not going to be as elevated as you want it to be, the truth is right. Like you already, you are already qualified, you know, you may not be experienced, but you are qualified. So you have enough qualifications to go get started and do the thing, like give yourself permission, right? Open your own gate, be the gatekeeper and open the gate, you know? Yes. I love that. More gatekeepers who are opening gates. That's so good. Yes. <laughs> so I have another question just kind of about entrepreneurship. Some people are more drawn towards entrepreneurship. Obviously, you are a longtime serial entrepreneur. I'm now embarking on full-time entrepreneurship. But not everybody necessarily has that desire. Some people may not want to embark on like lifetime entrepreneurship or be full-time entrepreneurs. You know, what does this framework of exploring abundance and open mindset or kind of millionaire ambitions look like for those people? And what are some things they can do if they maybe don't necessarily want to lead their own billion dollar company, but still want to be expansive and abundant? Yes. There's lots of ways to make money, right? And we can explore, like, there's so many different options. I think we all need to be entrepreneurial. We don't all have to be entrepreneurs, but I think we need to be entrepreneurial, looking for those opportunities. That's what an entrepreneur is doing. It's saying like, okay, I have a need and I'm going to match it with, and I have a skill, I'm going to match it with the marketplace and say like, where is there a need that I could fulfill? Or where is there an opportunity that I need to take advantage of? And so that's how we need to all be thinking whether we have full-time jobs or not. But <clears throat> there's so many ways that you can invest. For example, investing in the stock market above and beyond. Because what drives me nuts is people say like, oh, you know, I can do this much investment that's tax deductible. So that's all I'm going to do. And I'm like, baby girl, can we do a little bit more? <laughs> Like, forget that. <clears throat> exactly. It's not about the tax deduction. Like, sure, that's nice. Take it, right? But let's do above and beyond that and invest and start to see that money grow. I mean, when I started investing in the stock market, I put like, a, you know, I think I put $4,000 in. I had like extra money. I put in $4,000 and I just didn't touch it. I was like, let's see what's going to happen to that $4,000. <laughs> I was willing to risk it. And then I saw that it was growing and I was like, oh, if I had put $40,000 or like, you know, kept putting money in every month at this point, it would be X. So I was like, oh, okay. I see how this works now. Now I'm willing to put a little bit more in. So how can you dip your toe in um, is what I encourage people to do just to try something. So investing in the stock market is a great way to do it and not just for retirement, but also for like aggressively putting in and you don't even have to do anything crazy. You can invest in index funds. That's what I invest in. It's simple. I have like a, you know, portfolio of like different categories, but most of it is in index funds because it just works. Just do it, right? It works. It just keeps going up and to the right. That's what you want. <laughs> so like you're investing in the stock market, you can invest in real estate, you could buy a house and flip it and sell it. You know, you could buy a house and rent it out. Something that my sister did, the single mom that I mentioned, she has um, multi-family homes. So she has one that she lives in where she rents out the downstairs <clears throat> to a tenant who pays most of the mortgage. And then she has another investment property that, you know, over time she invested in and, you know, she gets she's collecting rent every month from that. And she has a full-time job, you know, so she's not building a whole business, but she's slowly creating her real estate empire and always saving for the next, you know, real estate investment, the next multifamily she's going to buy. So that's another opportunity. I invest in art. So there's all these amazing black artists that are emerging. And so I try to you know, invest and buy a beautiful piece when they are emerging so that the price goes up. And so far my like art portfolio, the price is going up. So like, 
my husband invests in watches. That's another thing that can go up and down. So like, there's just so many different categories that you can become an investor, right? And look for opportunities to invest. You can invest in other people's businesses. Another thing that I've done um, where you put money in and then, you know, it takes a while. So it could be five years later, that money is worth 10 X what you gave them, you know, and you've helped them accomplish their dream. So you could get in on Kickstarter. There's so many. And there was another amazing entrepreneur. Um, she runs a company called curl mix, which is like a hair care product. And she just did a crowdfunding, um, capital raise. Right. And so people could invest in her company for as little as $500. And so the whole community, like 700 different, you know, people in her community invested in the company. Now they all own a small piece of it. And as she grows that, if she grows that into a billion dollar brand, they're all going to have a nice return on their money. So just look for the opportunities to invest. And then also look for the opportunities to advance your career, right? Like what skills do I need to add to my tool set so I can make more money? Let me negotiate for higher pay. Let me get into a sales position where there's commission, where like I have an opportunity to increase my pay significantly. So always just be thinking about your money. It's the same tool set. It's just a different, you know, path. Definitely love that. Just the different ways to expand that toolkit and finding ways to like use your money to make more money. Yes, Exactly. Even time, right? Like, for example, I, I have a friend who has a co-founder for his company and that person works like really part time, but they have a certain skill set that's really valuable to the business. And so they do they take on those kinds of tasks that help the business get started. And they own like a small percentage, maybe it's like 15%, right? But 15% of my $10 million business would be significant, you know? So, um, so you could even invest with time, right? It doesn't even have to be money if you're looking for those opportunities. Definitely. Yeah. And even finding ways to like get creative and move things around. One of the things that I did, I had a lot of student loan debt that I paid off in 2022. And after I made that last payment, I set up an auto transfer for the same amount that I was paying towards my loans to go into my investment account that just automatically transfers and like buys index funds. So I don't even notice it. I don't miss it. It's what I was paying towards my student loans anyway, but now I'm just kind of paying myself and it's like another bill and I don't really check it that often. But I recently logged in and I was like, oh wait, that's grown. It's like in the past, you know, two years, it's done a little something of something that I, I didn't even miss because it's basically like it was like the same auto payment that was going to my loans anyway. And so I think almost gamifying it can be really fun. It's something I'm learning to figure out how to move things around and just grow assets a little bit more. Yes. And you could also use your creativity, right? Like starting a podcast, writing a book. I get royalty checks every quarter for the books that I've written and they just show up. And I'm always surprised because I forget about it. And then I'm like, oh, I love an extra you know, a extra sum of money that I then can put in my index funds. Or if I'm like, oh, there was something I wanted to invest in, I can leave my savings where it is and just use this. So there's, you can create income generating assets in course form, podcast form, writing a book. And I'm sure there's a thousand other ways that we're just not thinking of. <laughs> so that's why I encourage people to brainstorm. What do I want? And then what are all the ways that I could go, you know, make that happen? And it doesn't have to just be entrepreneurial. Totally. And to not sell your skills short, because I think a lot of us do that. We're like, oh, I don't know. I'm not good at anything. I don't do anything. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you do. <laughs> you can. <laughs> There's something you're already doing that you could be earning from. It's so true. I mean, when I was a young person, right, I had no money. In fact, my net worth was like negative six figures, you know, because of student loans. And, you know, what I had was this, myself. I was the only asset that I had available. And I use that asset to generate 10 million plus, you know? Um, so if I can do that, it, we all have it available to us if we want it. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Rachel, thank you so much. I feel so just reinvigorated and inspired by this conversation and just really thankful for your example and your work. Uh, as we wind down, can you please let the girlies know where they can find you, where they can find your books, if they're interested in working with you and working with Hello7, how they can learn more? Yes. So um, my book is We Should All Be Millionaires, available everywhere that there are books. And then I have um, 
two Audible originals, uh, Plan Your Year Like a Millionaire and Six Figure Side Hustle. So you can check those out and listen to them while you're going for a walk. You can just kind of do both at one time. That's what I do. I listen to audiobooks every day while I walk. And then go to hello7.co if you want to learn more about working with us. We have this great program called The Club. So hello7.co slash The Club is a membership community where you can get started on you know working towards creating the income that you want. Amazing. Thank you so much. And we'll make sure all of that is linked in the show notes to make it super easy for everyone to find. Thank you again for joining me. I just learned so much and am so inspired by this conversation. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Balanced Black Girl. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I hope that it inspired you to just be abundant and spacious and go after those big dreams and goals that you have. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to leave us a five-star rating and review because I'm always striving to give a five-star experience. So if you could rate and review either on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, that would be a huge help. Check out our show notes for more information about Rachel, her book, working with her. We have it all linked there. And we also have some amazing sponsors who are offering very generous, incredible hookup codes. So the next time you're in the market for your next wellness product or your favorite thing, make sure you check the show notes first because we probably have a code that can save you some money. Thank you so much for tuning in and I will see you next week. 